Good afternoon, everyone. Going to be speaking with Mary Beth Wilkis Janke, talking about inspiring women to be badass. It's a great topic. Looking forward to it. Here she is. Hold on. Hey, Mary Beth, how are you? Hi, Doc. How's it going? Good, good. Listen, I'm super pumped to have you uh, on the <laughs> podcast. You. I've been I've been looking forward to this interview for a while, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm beyond honored. Wonderful. I'm going to do a brief introduction just while everyone's logging on. Uh, we have the true pleasure of speaking with uh, my friend and colleague here, Dr. Mary Beth Wilkis Janke. Uh, she is a former U.S. Secret Service agent and current consultant in the field of forensic and clinical psychology. She is also a professor at uh, GW, where she teaches abnormal psychology and the psychology of crime and violence. Mary Beth holds a doctoral degree in clinical psychology, a master's degree in forensic psychology, and a bachelor's of science in criminal justice. She is also author of the best-selling book, The Protector, A Woman's Journey from Secret Service to Guarding VIPs and Working in Some of the World's Most Dangerous Places. Uh, she has a long list of accomplishments, including leading, leading an inquiry during the Iraq Gate investigation and an investigation for 60 minutes during the Duke lacrosse scandal. Mm -hmm. She is also known as the only female to ever officially protect a foreign president outside of the U.S. And she's here today to discuss her life, her experiences, and again, how to inspire women to be badasses. It's a topic that I find, <laughs> I find so near and dear to my heart. Um, and again, thanks for having, you know, thanks for having the time to join us. I'm really looking forward Absolutely. to talking to you. Yeah, saying this will be fun. So let's just start kind of from the beginning. You know, you chose a career that is not female oriented per se, at least conventionally. 100%, yeah. When did you decide to become a Secret Service agent? And tell us a little bit about the challenges behind that, how you overcame all the, all the challenges. Yeah. Yeah, for me, the light bulb uh, went off when I, I, I was in high school and I was a junior and we had a few um, sort of, uh, what do we call those offbeat courses? And I was like, oh, uh, they have a criminal justice course. Let me take that. Or it was like law and justice or something. And I remember one day I came home and I told my parents, oh my God, like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a federal agent. Like, th it was like so amazing because I was young. You know, and I thought, okay, this gives me focus. And now I know what I'm going to apply to when I'm going to apply to in college and looking for criminal justice programs. And, and just to say that everyone that's a federal agent is not a criminal justice major. I really want to make that clear. They, we come from all different, like, I mean, we're talking geology, geometry, like you name it, people study, whatever. It's just important that you have a college degree. And so, you know, I went to school at Indiana University for criminal justice. Um, I also uh, got a minor in Spanish, um, studied overseas. And then when I graduated, I actually went to live overseas. So what happened was I had graduated and I said to my parents, you know, I think I'm going to go study for a summer in, back in Seville, Spain or in Spain because I just want to be more bilingual. And I ended up staying three years. You know, it's kind of my gypsy blood. I, I kind of just whatever. And I, and I definitely came back more bilingual. And then I applied to the DEA and the Secret Service. So really, it was this whole like, um, they were neck and neck when one was doing the physical, the other one was doing the physical when one was doing the, the what they call the panel interview, the other was doing the panel interview. And, and to share with your audience, really the biggest hurdles in becoming a federal agent, it's just patience and time, because it's a really it can it can be a really long time. It used to be a ton of paperwork, it doesn't mean it still isn't. But Rick, back in the day, I mean, everything for us was written, you know, or typed, mm -hmm. not online, which is so convenient. You just send it in. Like I went down to the Secret Service office in Chicago and the DEA office and I picked up, you know, applications and I brought them home and I filled them out and then took them back down. Right. So just a different world. And that's nice. But it's still a lot. They delve so much into your life. And when I applied, they both said to me listen, plan to wait about two years because, you know, you've lived overseas. We have to check out all the different countries you've lived in. Um, just expect to wait two years. Nine months later, I had, you know, so I had moved from Chicago to Washington, D.C. And so my applications were shifted to those offices. And I'm working this job in D.C. and I'm working in Central America because I was bilingual at that point. 
and I'm coming back from this job this week in El Salvador and I decide I'm going to spend the weekend in Miami and your neck of the woods. And I'm, I'm in my hotel and again, back before we had cell phones. So I called into my office and I'm all getting my messages and they're like, Oh, some agent calls you from the Washington field office. I'm thinking, Oh God, what do they want now? Or, you know, like, what's the next hurdle? So I call and the guy's like, hi, Mary Beth. And I'm like, hi. <laughs> and he goes, he starts laughing and he goes, this is agent whoever, I'm calling to offer you a job with the Secret Service as a special agent. And this was nine, eight and a half, nine months into my process. And I'm thinking, what the hell? Like, you guys told me two years, but it was amazing. I almost fall off the bed. And in hindsight, I will say two things. And I think that, that these are still true. I think they pushed my application through one, I was a woman. They're looking to, they're always looking to, and we can talk about that a little bit about women in, in law enforcement. And two, I was a Spanish speaker. So like pull this woman on, like we're desperate for them. I was the only Spanish speaker in the entire Washington field office, which is just crazy. It's the epicenter of the entire secret service. And I was the only Spanish speaker. It's kind of amazing. Right. But well, it shows, but it shows the benefit of you found something you were passionate about. You knew it early and then you followed that passion, which I think I always preach to our residents and fellows, the fact that you find what you love and then it makes the entire process easier. But let's talk about your book, right? You both, sure. you wrote this book, um, The Protector. What was the, what was the impetus for that book? What, what space were you trying to fill? Okay, now this is a story you're not gonna expect. I'm not gonna say, I, I definitely had had like an outline of chapters over the years and every so often, like maybe if I was on a plane, I'll be like, I was bored. And I'd pull up my outline and maybe fill in some bullet points, right? But the true impetus was when I was living in Connecticut, getting my, I was doing my postdoc work and I went to see this medium for the second time. No, first time, second time. I've only seen her twice. And she starts out the session and she's like, do you write? And I'm like, well, you know, I've written some articles, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, yeah, you need to get back to that. And then she continues on with the session and she brings it up again. You really need to get back to that. I'm just, I'm really getting a lot of um, feedback and like, you really have a lot to say and you know, you need to get back to that. And I was like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. She stops the session at the third time and she goes, you need to stop saying no and you need to write the book. And I literally, Rick, I flipped her off. I mean, I don't even know this woman. And I said to her, easy for you to say, I'm not a good writer. And she was like this. Uh, there are editors for that. And she just continues on with the session. And I was like, <laughs> oh, God. And I, I really, it kind of like really made me think, like what, what is stopping me um, besides the fact that most people in my industry, because we work in the shadows, we kind of shut up and we don't write. So my book is not a tell-all, right? It's more about my experience in the field and my challenges um, and, and, and accomplishments because they just, they weren't all challenges. It's just that there were, it was so male dominated in some cases that was a pro in some cases that wasn't such a pro. So um, that was really what pushed me. And, you know, uh, I asked her to write a blurb for the back and she's like, why are you asking me? You need to ask other people that are in your field. I go, I gave her the B word. I was like, B, like, you're the one who, who like pushed me to do this. And she's like, okay, okay. Like, okay. So <laughs> That, that it's a, it's an answer that most people don't ask and that people are pretty shocked if they do ask or I tell them. I, I mean, your story is so inspirational, I think, for pretty oh, much every woman. Talk about your upbringing. Where did, where did your drive and your passion and your yeah. grit come from? Talk about your upbringing and yeah. the effect that had on you. Huge. Yeah. So I'm one of seven kids um, raised in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, all of my siblings are athletic. Uh, my parents are athletic. And I think that matters for the field I went into as far as, you know, that drive, that determination, that discipline. Um, I also think birth order very much mattered in my case. In other words, so, so fathom this. I am the fifth kid of five in a row. We're seven, but so my parents knocked out five of us in five years and I'm the fifth, okay? And then my two sisters come three and eight years after me. So think about bringing me home from the hospital and there's a one-year-old, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, 
and a four-year-old already at home. Like, do you just not want to give me to the neighbors? <laughs> right? I mean, like, so the fact is my parents were awesome, but like, there's only so much attention to go around. And so I feel that me being the fifth kid in that order really made me more of an observer, very independent, right? I mean, it was like, okay, well, they're busy. And of course, very mischievous. I was always trying to get away with it. Shit, sorry. I don't know if we're allowed to swear. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, stuff. And I did, but it just like made me um, really super independent, observant, tough, really tough. Um, again, the athletics. Um, the birth order thing also mattered as follows. Because when I went to high school, I followed four people in a row, right? And all four of them, for example, had taken uh, German as a language. And I was thinking to myself, who the heck takes German? Like, what a waste, right? I mean, I'm not going to be an engineer. So I decided I wanted to take Spanish. Um, I also played volleyball. And my four older siblings played tennis. Even though we were all tennis players, I was like, I think I was constantly looking to distinguish myself because it got annoying walking into classrooms like, oh, because my maiden name is Wilkes. And they'd say, oh, another Wilkes. Are you as smart as your siblings? And I'd be like, Oh God, I'd be like, no, but I'm cuter or no, but I'm funnier, <laughs> you know, like whatever I could come up with. So I think that birth order really was constantly looking for me to just separate myself and be my own me. Now, what about role models? You obviously had amazing role models. Tell us who was your biggest role model growing up and to this day, who is your role model? You know... I would say my parents were my role models. And why do I say that? I mean, if I look at who I am today, I am stoic and stubborn and determined like my mother. And I am a people person and have the gift of gab. Um, and sometimes laid backness from my father, you know, it just really depends on, on what I'm doing. And so I couldn't be more thankful for, to, for that mix um, because it's really all those factors play into who I was as an agent, who I was in the private sector and who I've become. Um, currently, I would still put them there, but they're both gone. Um, I have a couple of mentors in the field. One is named Tony Scotty. So he's been my mentor for quite a while. He was known as like the guru of like anti-terrorism and defensive driving. And he just took me out under his wing like a daughter. Um, so that's somebody who I admire for, for a few reasons. One is he's a man of integrity, which is not, you know, we lit my industry, my former industry, meaning the private sector of executive protection. Whilst I think there are a lot of amazing and awesome people with integrity, it's also a field where you have a lot of stolen valor. Um, a lot of, oh, I was a SEAL, I was special forces, I was this, and it's like, really? You know, and then you find out they weren't because you just got to ask the right questions. So, you know, I look at Tony as a man of integrity, someone who's really, he's been tough on me, but he's also really encouraged me the way kind of like my parents would have been. And so is, did they instill that confidence in you? Because clearly within talking to you in five and 10 minutes, I realized that your confidence is such an important factor in your success. Where did you get that confidence from? And where should women in general as they're growing up, where do they attain that type of self-esteem confidence? Yeah. Um, you know, my whole dissertation was on increasing self-esteem in young women. So it's funny. I think they're very intertwined. They're slightly different, but let's just for easiness, ease, uh, consider them, you know, the same here, the construct. Um, I think it's hard to say when I was younger, just because I think once I became good at things, meaning I was a really good volleyball player, I, I was decent at tennis, but I also was from a family of tennis players. So that wasn't as significant as finding my own thing that I was good at. And I think, you know, in high school, again, playing volleyball over tennis from my siblings and speaking Spanish over German, just to find the things that I was different and good at. So I think young people in general, male or female, need to find what they're good at and pursue it, whether that's art, music, sports, academics, whatever it is, there's so many different intelligences, right? And then it's also as an older adult and being more cognizant of what it takes, and especially now being a psychologist, it's very cognitive behavioral, meaning what are we telling ourselves? Where's the self-talk? And, and I think a lot of your, your listeners might 
or viewers might be surprised or maybe not and people that I might know is it doesn't mean I don't doubt myself or it doesn't mean I don't start that sort of like negative self-talk. It's natural, but it's about stopping it and shifting it and choosing a different lens and saying, you know, instead of, oh God, I'm a disaster. It's like, well, am I a disaster? No, I'm not a disaster. You know, I can do this. I can do this interview. I can, you know, why are you saying no? It's purely fear-based, right? So then you shift it to yes and you just do it scared. So when women do framing, I think is what you're talking about, how to frame reality into a positive sense. It, talk about today's culture. I mean, it seems like modern day culture, today's society favors male success over female success. Mm -hmm. How do women in today's society frame their success in order to maintain mm -hmm. confidence and, and self-esteem? Yeah, I think you know, that's interesting you say that about male success over female success. I think part of that is we are kind of like, oh, no, like, yeah, no, no big deal. You know, like my husband or my brother or my dad or like we we just like are so used to taking care of other people. We don't do well. Well, most of us don't do well with the spotlight. So it's easy to like, like blow off success, even though it's what we want. Right. So how do we frame that i'm kind of lost i lost track of what you were asking me Sorry. yeah meaning like how do you how did you deal with the obstacles and the clear sexism that exists back when you were going through training and yeah. today which still exists w yeah. what do you recommend to women going through that yeah okay so so let's make it clear i so this is what a friend of mine says because i said you know i walked into a male dominated field. He goes, Mary Beth. He calls me Mary B. Mary B, you didn't walk. You barged your way in. Okay. So the fact is, if, if I'm naive about the fact that I'm walking into a male dominated culture, then that's my bad. I, how can I expect red carpet roses and, you know, champagne? You know, I was also, this is, I entered federal law enforcement in 1990, 1991. Okay. 30, 30 years ago. And so even though it still exists and there are, there are more women in law enforcement, there's more women in the military, recognize that you're walking into a male dominated field, just like if a man walked into probably back when men started becoming nurses and still to this day, there's tons more female nurses than there are male nurses. So they probably have that challenge. So in this case, it's a little different because this is such a, I always say a very testosterone related RoboCop type, you know, um, business. So, my mentality was, okay, I kind of have to earn my respect. That, that was my mentality. And so I kept my head down. I did my flipping job and I earned the respect. It doesn't mean that I didn't get jabbed. It doesn't mean that I didn't have comments. It didn't mean that I didn't have doubters. But to me, like, for example, when one guy said to me when we were going through training, it's like, he says to me one day and he looks at me with this like really like aggressive face and he goes, why are you even here? Like, why don't you just go home? And I just looked at him and I go, I just started laughing. And I go, I'm kind of having a great time. I'm not going anywhere. Now, it doesn't mean that that comment didn't affect me. Okay. But I didn't let him, you know, one of my mottos is never let him see you sweat. So I probably just did a long run and then realized that's about him, not about me. It's a bitter guy and I'm not going anywhere. And, you know, when I was an agent, then one guy said to me, and we ended up becoming friends, but one day we were sitting in a command post and he says to me, Buick, booze, broads, like those were the good old days, you know, until you guys walked in. And I look over at him and I go, God, it sounds to me like that was the best decision the service ever made. And he just starts <laughs> laughing, right? It's just like, you know, like keep swat. I just got to keep swatting them, right? And just keep doing my job. And, and I really feel like I earned the respect in all the missions, if not, I'd say most, I can't say every person, but most missions and the majority of, of the people I worked with. It's that focus and ignoring the noise. There's so much white noise. People just, you know, constantly talking, talking bullshit and you're just, you just ignore, you know, the task at hand and you get it done. What would you say inspires you daily? Hmm. Self pride. I mean, um, I'm 57. I still work out five to seven days a week. Um, I did that also during COVID. I, I would be like, oh, there's no way COVID's making me fat, you know? <laughs> um, and that is that self-pride thing. It's like, 
it, it, it becomes a mindset, quite frankly. Um, you know, like you're talking about the noise and whatever, just because other people, like it was all around us, you know, during, during COVID, during crappy times, during whatever. I have to focus in on myself. I can hear all that, but then I have to focus in and say, what works for me? Rolling up in a ball and, and crying foul or being a victim or, you know, just succumbing to circumstances in the world doesn't work for me. You know, I, I, as you know, worked in some pretty non-safe places and non-clean places like Port-au-Prince, Haiti, Bogota, Colombia, Lima, Peru. You know, I also worked really nice places. Um, but the, the, for me, the bigger the challenge, the more fulfilling, the more I proved to myself and the more confidence it gave me that I could even do more. I love the idea of moving on to the next challenge. You say that, and I feel like that's a big component of, of, of anyone's success, male or female. The people that are truly successful and great at what they do, once they finish one challenge, they look for the next challenge and they thrive off of that environment. <laughs> um, what would you say is the number one reason that women don't reach their full potential in life? Mm. I think it's the self-talk. I think that, you know, this example that I give sometimes is, you know, when you think, oh gosh, I want to apply for that job, but maybe it's out of my league. Bull, choose, choose a different lens. Tell yourself, instead of telling yourself you don't belong, you tell yourself you belong in any room or in any job that you choose to be in. And the mindset will shift and you'll be a little bit more badass, right? Like everything doesn't work out, but shift the mindset. Like, Stop. To, I, I, I tell tons of my clients this. It's okay. It's okay to be hard on yourself because if you aren't, nobody else is going to, and that's what gets you further in life. But the self-criticism, stop it. You know, when one of my clients said to me, you know what, Mary Beth, because I said that to her, I gave her that. She goes, you're right. There's so many other people in line ready to do that. Why would I be one of them? Right? So I think that was, that's one of those things that keep us from succeeding. We tell ourselves we don't deserve it you know, oh, I don't really think I, I, I earned that. That was really so-and-so because we're still pretty new to higher positions and success and whatever, even though it's been a couple 20 years, but we still have a long way to go to, because it, we are still in a position and it may never change of, do I select motherhood? Do I select a profession? Can I do both? I have to do everything, you know, can I versus I have to. And then I'm failing miserably. I'm, I suck at this. I suck at everything. And it's like, no, you don't. You're killing it. But it's like this constant thing of feeling like we have to do everything perfectly, you know? And so we aren't unidimensional. We have to be multidimensional. At least we feel like we have to be multidimensional and kill every dimension. So a little bit of self-compassion, changing the self-talk and being kinder and less critical, I guess, are some of those things. And just, you know, we deserve it. Like, who says? Such great, such great advice. You know, something interesting in your book that I was reading and I wanted to ask you about. Sure. You talk about this um, emotional isolation that exists mm. in women who are high functioning and powerful like yourself, who elevate their careers. They're kind of, there's a lack of support because they're so high functioning, because they're so out of the spectrum for what maybe people consider what women should be doing. Yeah. You discuss that emotional isolation and did you feel yeah. it? And how did you deal with it? Yeah. Uh, yes, sometimes, depending. Uh, I think sometimes it would be like an imposter syndrome, um, that emotional isolation. Because there are fewer women in the higher positions, there are few women, fewer women that you can sort of confide in. Secondly, and I'm going to say this, and I hope this makes some of your female viewers second think how they operate. Sometimes we really suck with each other. You know, sometimes we can be catty and as opposed to supportive, like we're like, oh, that be, you know, oh, she, I can't believe she got that promotion. Why didn't I get that promotion? As opposed to saying, girl, you killed it. Like you so deserved it. Like I am, my, my work right now is highly focused on women's empowerment. And I guess part of that a part of my secret, I'm just kind of processing this now, is I am balanced. I'm happy where I am. I feel good about me. So if everybody else raises higher than me, if I'm where I am happy being, then that matters. But I don't, I, I don't think I've ever felt 
God, this is going to sound, I don't know how it's going to sound, but I don't know if I've really ever felt a lot of competition. I mean, there weren't a lot of women in the field back when I was in it. And then as a private investigator, it's a completely different world. So, and as a psychologist, there really isn't competition. I mean, not that I felt, right? So I, I feel like I am, I don't understand why we aren't better with each other. So the emotional isolation, yes, I felt it, but more like I can think of one place, which was Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And it was, you know, that was because it was 10 men on my team and me, and it wasn't a place where I had a normal life. Like when I was in Bogota, Colombia for two and a half years, I had girlfriends. I had, I had a life outside of it. And so I didn't really care what my teammates were doing in their free time. Whereas in Port-au-Prince, it was just me. And it wasn't like, hey, let's go to the theater. Let's go to a bar. That stuff just didn't exist. So it was very isolating for me. Um, how did I deal with that? My usual, go for long runs, watch movies, read books, drink wine. Sounds like a great combination. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like an awesome combination. Sign me up. I, I, um, I think if you look at people like yourself that are ultra successful, I think something that unifies everyone is the ability to take um, a setback and turn that into an opportunity, right? Because mm -hmm. no matter who you are in whatever career, everyone feels disappointment, feels setback, and has negative encounters. It's how you interpret that and how you turn that into a positive that yeah. makes you successful in the end. How did you do that so well? Because your book talks about different setbacks and how Thank you. instead of instead of falling back and doubting, you turned it into a positive. And discuss the importance of that, how you did it, and why women should should take that same, same mentality. Yeah, I think I would be channeling my mother here. Remember, I told you I got that stoicism, the determination, the stubbornness, is I am not a victim. Like, there is no way. Like, fire me, kick me on uh, in my butt, you know, knock me on my butt, criticize me. That's just going to fuel me. You know, tell me I can't. Oh, boy. I love it because that's just going to fuel me to show you, oh, yeah, I can. And you know what? I'll be filing my nails afterwards um, <laughs> as, you, as you sit there and, like, sizzle, right? So a lot of that, you know, that sort of, sort of like the federal agent, you know, applying to be a federal agent when I was young is a lot of people are like, oh, you can't do that. You're a woman. I'm like, oh, watch me, right? So I think a lot of that is just like that, like, you know, determination to prove people wrong, Um I also think, again, going back to self-pride, I think that's part of my fuel as well. So there is no way that any setback or whatever, it's not gonna, it, again, I will say, it doesn't mean that I don't have my, my self-pity moments or the uh, why me or whatever, but then I hit the gym or I do whatever, I process it and I'm like, yeah, quit whining and get your, back, get your butt back out there and either apply for a new job, look for a new mission, find a new challenge doesn't all work out, but I can say I've lived a life I'm pretty damn proud of. God, that is such amazing advice for, for women. What, what would you say, how do you personally inspire women to never sell themselves short and always aim for greatness? Yeah, I mean, sort of a lot of what I'm saying is, you know, it doesn't mean you don't feel pain or that you don't, there aren't bumps in the road, but just re and here's where the resilience comes in because that's a factor too the confidence the self esteem the resilience it's all intertwined in that cognitive behavioral that i was talking about earlier is you know we can have our glitches we can have our crappy phases but if you constantly look forward versus the rearview mirror you know we all have we all have crap in our lives i mean my life has not been perfect you know that from reading my book and that's only part of it but so what like who has a perfect life besides maybe a, a monk who meditates for 20 hours a day in isolation, right? And I'm not saying that condescendingly. I'm just saying that's a very isolated world. But in the real world, people, you're a, you're a pinball. You get knocked around and you hit bumpers and you bang your head, and, but you keep moving forward. You, know, you might have a busted leg or a, a, a concussion or whatever that might slow you down. But there's a future. Stop. Get out, get out of that. Get out of the rearview mirror. You know, there's a saying, something like there's a reason why the windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror. So we oh, nice. look forward instead of focusing on the, the past. So that's how I look at it. Again, do whatever it takes to get over that crappy moment, whether it's therapy, whether it's journaling, whether it's meditation, whatever it takes. Look to your friends. There are tons of coping mechanisms out there now. And again, therapy isn't what it used to be, right? There's so many modalities. But 
We all need help at different times of our life, but you want to focus forward, not backwards, because that will just keep you stymied and God, that can just spiral you into a negative depression. Let's say that a young woman is, is talking to you and obviously your story is so motivational and so inspirational. Thank you. The single biggest piece of advice you would give to a young woman who looks at you and says, I want to be like Mary Beth. And I'll say, and yes, you can. Just keep telling yourself, I, I can. You know, I have, you can't see it, it's on my computer here, but I have different uh, mantras around my house because I said, it's not, it doesn't mean I don't have doubt, okay? So I have one on my mirror, it says, I'm stronger than I think I am. I have a little sticker here that says, you are beautiful. Um, these are reminders, you know, these are little things I, I, little tools I have my clients do as well, mantras. You know, we talk about our cognitions and it's this constant like, don't tell yourself that you can't. Don't listen to people that tell you you can't. You know, have you ever heard the Henry Ford quote? Um, at least he's credited with it. Whether you believe you can or you can't, it's true. So I'll say it again because sometimes people are like, what? Um, whether you believe you can or you can't, it's true. So if you believe you can, it's true. So believe you can. And, and look for those mentors or those people that will carry you along get rid of the toxic people toxic people that are telling you you can't that's i i could talk to you forever but i'm gonna <laughs> stop the interview here because i know you're super busy what an amazing interview oh i'm super busy who am i talking to mr <laughs> <laughs> your but your story your confidence your grit your ability to ignore the noise like we talked about earlier yeah and achieve what you want to achieve regardless of what society tells you. Absolutely. I think that is that is such an amazing role model for women growing up. Thank you for all you do. You, I don't think you realize how big of a role model you are, but it's truly amazing. And God bless you for everything you do. I, I, if Thank everyone you. followed, if everyone followed your mantra, the world would be a much better place. Oh, thank God, you're very kind. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks for having me on. This is fun. Of course. And we'll just say girl power. Okay. And have a great weekend. <laughs> Thank All you right? too, Rick. Take care. All right. Take care. Have a great bye -bye. weekend.